Hello, and welcome to the webinar, Understanding America's Rural Urban Interface, drawn from the July issue of the Annals of the American Academy of Political and Social Science. The webinar features the two guest editors of that special issue, Dan Lichter and James Iliak, as well as Shannon Monnet and Mark Partridge. My name is Michael Todd, and I'm the editor of the Social Science Space website. Let me introduce you a little more fully to our speakers for today's webinar. We'll begin with the two guest editors, again, of that July 2017 Annals issue, The New Rural Urban Interface, Dan Lichter and James Siliak. Dan is the Ferris Family Professor in the Department of Policy Analysis and Management, Professor of Sociology, and Director of the Institute for the Social Sciences, all at Cornell University. James is the Gatton Chair in Macroeconomics, Director of the Center for Poverty Research, and Executive Director of the Kentucky Federal Statistical Research Data Center, all at the University of Kentucky. They are joined by Mark Partridge, the C. William Swank Chair of Rural Urban Policy at The Ohio State University and a professor in the Agricultural, Environment, and Development Economics Department, and by Shannon Monnet, the Learner Chair for Public Health Promotion and Senior Research Associate at the Center for Policy Research at Syracuse University. This one-hour webinar will be recorded and archived for future viewing. We will be sending out a link to view it and to access the slides to all registrants in the coming weeks. Now, if any of you have any problems with audio or viewing mode during the webinar, please use the Q&A box on the right of your screen, and one of our helpful team members will get back to you ASAP. At the end of the presentation part of the webinar, we'll have time for question and answers uh, from the audience to the, to the panelists. So please also use the Q&A box to ask any questions to speakers throughout the webinar. And I want to stress that you can ask questions while they're speaking, even though we won't get to them until a little bit later. Uh, so please feel free to ask questions and leave comments there. Now, let's start the conversation. Dan? <clears throat> thank you, Michael. And thank you to the audience for joining us today to talk about rural America and how it fits into America's increasingly urban uh, society. Uh, this volume, this special issue of the annuals, comes out of a conference that uh, many of us political scientists, economists, sociologists, policy people, uh, a conference at uh, the Annenberg School at the University of Pennsylvania back in September before the election. And I think it's fair to say that after election, uh, the topic of rural America has never been uh, uh, more uh, deeply debated and contested about uh, the people left behind there. Uh, so Dan, our, real quick, we're not seeing your slides. Oh, you're not seeing it now? Okay. No, if we could just redo that, that'd be great. There we go, Thank thanks. You. Okay, thanks so much. So uh, the special issue came out in July, and uh, so what I'm gonna do today is uh, give you our, a little bit of background to the special issue and, and provide a context for uh, uh, Jim, Mark, and, and Shannon to talk about more detailed aspects of, of the special issue. Uh, in the opening chapter, we provide an overview of rural America. There's 46 million of them. And I think one of the common themes is that the United States has, of course, become an increasingly urban society made up of densely settled cities and uh, rapidly expanding urban conglomerations. And I think the issue for many rural Americans is that the cities are where culture is shaped and reshaped by politics, media, and money. And in many cases, the continuing urbanization of American society has refocused or uh, refocused uh, America's debates, policy debates, research, and discussions on big city issues. And these in, uh, interests have often come at the expense of rural people who feel like they've uh, been uh, left behind. And we cover these issues in our, in our uh, opening chapter that provides a forum or a background for later chapters. And I think it's fair to say, perhaps, that I think people think that the rural-urban divide has never been greater, but one of the paradoxes, I think, and the paradoxes that come through in this particular issue is it's also fair to say that uh, rural communities and urban people have never been more uh, tightly integrated and interdependent, and I think that's going to become clear today in some of the discussion uh, later today. So the overall goal of this special issue is to really help us discard what we think are some outdated rural stereotypes and to acknowledge several particular facts. And one of them is that the 
economic destinies of rural and urban people and communities are increasingly linked. They're basically flip sides of the same coin and that the that they share destinies rather than act as competitors. There's no clear rural urban divide and we show this across many different parts of rural and urban America that the destinies are linked between rural people and communities. The second is that the boundaries that define rural and urban areas, whether they're technical boundaries about what is a rural place or social boundaries about what characterizes rural people versus urban people, is that these boundaries are highly fluid and ambiguous. It's, it's unfortunate today to think about rural people as uh, sort of this unchanging uh, conglomeration that we're sort of stuck in rural America and we don't or aren't exposed to urban America. And we show how that's simply not the case today in today's modern urban oriented society. And then lastly, we want to spend a little bit of time talking about how rural America is sometimes left behind with the current metro, with a current uh, metro centric view of America's problems. And we say this because uh, many people have only a, a small connection to rural America, unlike a generation or two ago where they people would go back to their hometowns in rural America or visit grandparents or older generations. And so they were much more exposed. The younger generation today has none of that uh, in the same way that uh, many older people in America uh, have today. So I think some of the interest in rural America uh, comes about as a result of the backlash from the uh, 19, 2016 presidential election. And we've, we had already seen a little bit of this with Hillbilly Elegy that talks about the despair and disrepair in parts of rural Appalachia left behind by the decline in the coal industry, people moving off uh, to other parts, leaving behind people who are unemployed, don't have drug problems and so on. We also saw this in Arlie Hochschild's new book on strangers in their own land where rural people uh, are resentful of immigrants or minorities cutting in line or perceived to be cutting in line. And of course, Catherine Kramer at the University of Wisconsin also has a, a volume on the politics of resentment. And here she's talking about rural people who feel like they're left behind and ignored by an increasingly urban population. So the interest in rural issues is, is, is probably never been greater. And a lot of it, I think, comes from the most recent election. And I think the main point that we're trying to get across in this boundary or in this uh, issue is that the boundaries that separate rural and urban people and communities is not really a line at all. And I, we say this for several different reasons. One is, is that rural people are not typically rural their entire life. There's a shifting of boundaries from uh, rural communities that grow up, they develop, they attract population. Uh, and families and economic development, they grow up to be urban areas. So many places start out as rural, but they are successful, they grow up. I think what's different about today, however, is that that process is start, has, has, has stopped in many ways, that rural places now overall are actually experiencing absolute population decline. And that's never happened before in American society. So this idea of reclassification to urban areas is occurring at the same time we've seen unprecedented levels of rural depopulation. We also see uh, growing patterns of rural urban migration. I mean, people move from rural and urban areas to the other areas and, or rural commuters. People uh, are living in rural areas and commuting to urban jobs. So this back and forth, which exposes individuals both to rural environments and to urban environments. For example, we know that about uh, over half of all rural people, for example, live in the exurban areas, technically defined by the Census Bureau as rural areas uh, of, of major metropolitan cities. So they live in rural areas, the exurban areas, and they work in urban areas or the metropolitan area. And lastly, we also have uh, areas outside of these big cities, these exurban areas where the line, there is no line that people actually on a daily basis live and work uh, and operate on either side of the uh, of the boundary. So this boundary can be very, very blurred. So in this particular volume, and I hope we get questions from the audience on this, we deal with four what we think are intersecting themes. We talk about the urbanization of rural spaces, and by that I mean urban America is expanding into rural areas, and it shows up in the form of greater racial and ethnic heterogeneity, 
It shows up in new immigrant settlement patterns in rural areas. We know that about 60% of the growth in rural areas over the last 10 years has been located in Hispanic populations. Uh, Jim and Mark are going to talk about rural-urban economic transitions. You can just think about Amazon and how they provide resources or uh, products to all of America, not just urban America, or a satellite and cable that uh, connect uh, rural people to the urban economy. At the same time, rural areas are a source of uh, hydroelectric power, uh, a source of uh, uh, green energy, uh, agriculture, food, and so on. It's a place where people, urban people, consume uh, rural America and fishing, outdoor recreational activities, and so on. We also see changing inner uh, American institutions, prison populations that dominate rural areas that contain urban uh, offenders. Or we can think about schools at the local area level that are regulated by federal policy, uh, leave no child behind and so on. And then lastly, of course, our, our volume deals with the health and well-being of rural and urban uh, people and how the health is continued on in part living in one and moving to another, uh, access to health care, access to mental health facilities, and the stress associated with that. So in the end, we come away with several different lessons I think that are important to think about from our research and policy perspective. Uh, one is that we need to rethink how we divide up rural and urban people. I think this matters in terms of how we think about them. There's no divide at all, but rather uh, a, a kind of continuum of rural and urban activities, rural and urban people, rural and urban communities, and they're very much integrated with each other in today's modern economy. Uh, a second thing is I think we are still organized administratively in the university and government uh, in ways that I think reinforce in some ways outdated or stereotypical definitions that make problem solving difficult. We can think about things like HUD, housing and urban development, which the name itself suggests that housing is a problem in urban areas, but of course we have issues with housing in rural areas as well. We think about public housing or we think about trailer uh, parks or manufactured homes and so on. So we need to rethink about what it means to be rural and whether these stereotypes have really outlived their uh, usefulness in terms of administrative uh, connections and the way we handle social problems administratively. And lastly, I think we need to think about and not reify rural and urban people. By reify, I mean, you know, people change. There's a fluidity of these boundaries. People can be living in small town America and get enveloped by the expansion of the urban periphery. And we see that all over America as metropolitan areas have gotten bigger over time. And I think this pattern or this, this, these demographic and economic processes should be better reflected in our research programs in the many topics that we uh, choose to study. Rural areas shouldn't be ghettoized in academia or in public policy discussions. And I think this is important in how we define uh, solutions to our most pressing public policy problems today, whether it's climate change, whether it's immigration, or what have you. So thank you very much. I hope that sets some of the background for our next two speakers, and I'll hand this over uh, to, to Jim, and he can talk about uh, some of the major uh, changes that have occurred economically over the recent past in rural and urban areas. Great. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate it. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Um, there we are. Perfect. So uh, what I want to do is spend a few minutes to uh, highlight some of the economic background underlying the, the volume. Uh, I want to underscore the shared economic destinies uh, between our metro and non-metropolitan places in the United States. Uh, I don't think uh, you know, many people are, are as well aware of how the trends affecting uh, labor markets in particular um, have coincided between metro and non-metro America over the last 35 years. And that's what uh, my, my presentation will, uh, will emphasize, some of these shared uh, you know, uh, correlations between trends in wages and earnings and uh, incomes. And then I'll conclude by uh, highlighting a couple of the contributions in the volume that, that focus on um, potential uh, uh, divergent destinies, depending on what part of the distribution uh, you are located in, and how uh, there are similarities and, and differences um, uh, across America in these outcomes. So the, the first outcome, all the data that I'm presenting uh, 
is from the uh, March Current Population Survey, the Annual Social and Economic Supplement. And what I'm showing in this first graph here is trends in employment rates. So this is, did you work for pay at any time in the prior year? So this is employment at any point in time in the prior year. And uh, on the uh, left uh, upper and lower panel, that's for metropolitan areas. And on the right uh, upper and lower panel, that's for non-metropolitan areas. The, the top two figures are for men and the bottom two figures are for women. And the emphasis or the focus here is on um, the population of individuals between the ages of uh, 19 to 64. And it, we're covering the calendar years 1979 to 2015. And so one takeaway that you can see uh, both amongst men and women, uh, whether you're in metropolitan America or non-metropolitan uh, America, is that there's been a uh, steady retreat from work. And you can see that that retreat from work um, um, cuts across the, the education distribution. So uh, whether you are a high school dropout or somebody with a college degree or more, that there has been a, a slow decline uh, in employment in the United States uh, across the board. And you can see that the levels are, are comparable between uh, men in metro and non-metro areas and uh, women in metro and non-metro areas. So employment uh, is not a, a, a big divergence uh, across the uh, uh, geographic spectrum in the United States. Uh, the one potential ex uh, exception is with uh, men in non-metropolitan areas. You can see this uh, for, for those with less than high school education. There you can see a very strong drop-off in employment rates uh, that's more significant than, than for other groups. And what's interesting is that if you um, decompose the men in uh, metro areas by race, you'll see that uh, men in non-metro areas have employment rates uh, comparable to African-American men in, in metro areas. So again, there's uh, more similarities than, than, than differences. So again, underscoring the shared destinies of employment. Now, we also see that the trends in wages, this is uh, mapping out in inflation-adjusted terms in 2010 dollars, trends in the median average hourly wage of men and women. So this is taking the uh, annual earnings in the prior year divided by the annual hours of work in the prior year and then adjusting for uh, the personal consumption expenditure later. And here you can see that there is there is uh, effectively two, two time periods, especially for men, it's quite stark for men, is that there is a period from 79 to around 1995 where wages were relatively constant. Uh, for those with uh, high school or more, uh, and some steady decline for those uh, without high school uh, di diplomas, and, and this is true for both men and metro and non-metro areas. And um, uh, but then after '95, there was kind of this jump up between '95 and 2000 uh, uh, across uh, kind of the metro and non-metro locations, and then a flattening out once again. Now. I think what stands out in, in for both men and women in both uh, uh, locations is that you can see that the wage level, especially for those uh, with college or more, is, is uh, considerably higher in metropolitan areas than in non-metro areas. This is true for both men and women. And there was a very nice paper published a few years ago uh, by Enrico Moretti at uh, University of California at Berkeley where he uh, looked at these trends in wages and uh, made an adjustment uh, for uh, local differences in cost of living. And he finds that uh, uh, about uh, uh, one quarter of this gap uh, can be accounted for by differences in the cost of living, that metro areas are higher costs than, than non-metro areas. So some of that gap is, is accounting for differences in cost of living. But the overall trends are quite comparable. So we have a situation where wages for the last 15 years have been stagnant regardless of education level and for both uh, men and women and in metro and non-metro America. And, and if you then take the product of wages times hours of work, you can see very similar trends with uh, annual earnings 
This is uh, median earnings um, for, for these groups, again, in inflation-adjusted terms and costing $2,000. You can see that for women, especially those with uh, college or more, they've experienced more secular increase in uh, real earnings over the last 35 years. Again, this is uh, true for, for both uh, Metro and non-Metro America. And then once you adjust for differences in cost of living, the, the gap between the Metro and non-Metro uh, areas uh, shrinks. And so, again, there's very common trends between these areas. Um, and, and, and we wanted to underscore that uh, this you know, shared economic experience is, is perhaps uh, more widely shared than, than is commonly uh, appreciated. Um, the United States, especially with the onset of the welfare reforms of the 1990s, shifted um, um, our social safety net towards a more work-based focus uh, from uh, an out-of-work uh, focused safety net. And so what this figure is showing, uh, again, for men and women, uh, metro, non-metro, is the probability of participating in any of the major um, social uh, safety net programs, excluding the health program. So this would be temporary assistance for needy families, TANF, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, or, or food stamps, Supplemental Security Income, the Earned Income Tax Credit, or the child, Refundable Child Tax Credit. And you can see that uh, uh, for both men and for women, that there's been strong uh, increase in participation of the safety net. Uh, the the bumps that you see around the recessionary periods in the early 90s and, and around the Great Recession, around 28, those uh, surges are primarily driven by the food stamp or SNAP program, but the overall secular gro growth is largely accounted for by the rise of the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit, which is being taken up by people across the uh, education distribution. Next, what I do is I kind of add it all together and uh, look at total after-tax and transfer income. Um, so I include uh, federal income taxes, Social Security taxes, state income taxes. Uh, I include all cash uh, uh, welfare programs collected. I include in-kind programs, including uh, SNAP uh, and housing benefit. And, and I look at uh, tax units in the United States. So this is at the tax unit uh, level, those tax units headed by a man versus a woman, uh, and again, in metro and non-metro. And again, you can see that uh, by and large, the trends are the same uh, for, for uh, both men and women. Most of the growth occurred uh, th through up to 2000, and then things have been stable with this slight dip around the Great Recession from 2008 to 2010, and then stability once again. So, you know, after you add it all in, you can see, you know, this is quite pronounced, that even um, in inflation adjusted, not accounting for cost of living differences between metro and non-metro areas, that the gap between um, uh, men and metro and non-metro and women and metro and non-metro uh, uh, in incomes, once you account for the tax and transfer system, are much more similar than they are different. Now, uh, so that's kind of at the median where half the population is above, half is below. And so, you know, I'll conclude with a couple of slides about a potential tale of two tails. And by tails here, I'm referring to the uh, lower tail of the income distribution and poverty, and then the upper tail in terms of inequality. So uh, in the paper by uh, Laura Nolan, Jane Walfogel, and uh, Chris Weimer in the volume, they focus on kind of the long-term trends in poverty in rural and urban areas. And they are focusing on uh, two measures of poverty. The official poverty measure used by the Census Bureau uh, that does not uh, account for any taxes, nor does it account for income transfer programs. And therefore, it misses programs like the SNAP program and the EITC. Uh, and instead, they also uh, present evidence on the trends in the supplemental poverty measure, uh, which does account for both the taxes and these in-kind benefits. And here, what you can see is that uh, one of the themes of the, of the volume is boundary crossing. If you look at the left panel with the official poverty rates, you can see that uh, under the official measure, in every year, 
for the last 50 years, poverty rates have been uh, uh, higher in rural America than in urban America. The trends are the same, uh, by and large, uh, especially since uh, uh, the, the mid-1970s, uh, but the levels have been consistently higher. But once you account for the uh, tax and transfer system, you can see this boundary crossing that occurs on the right panel around 1993 where uh, the poverty rates actually in, in rural America fall below those in urban America, and the trends are not necessarily the same. The trend continued to be uh, towards the lower poverty rates in, in rural areas and, and uh, stable or even increasing poverty rates in urban areas. So there it suggests as though uh, people in the lower part of the income distribution uh, may have different uh, contact with the safety net and that may have uh, implications for overall well-being that are important to keep in mind. Uh, next is this issue of mobility. And so the, the paper by uh, Bruce Weber and his uh, colleagues focuses on the issue of intergenerational mobility. And what this figure is showing is using the data from the uh, expansive project by Raj Chetty and his colleagues using uh, individual uh, tax return data to map out uh, trends in, in mobility since uh, uh, the 1980s in the United States using tax data. And what this figure is showing is that um, uh, red colors means lower mobility, blue color, dark blue colors means higher mobility. And, and what we're looking at is, you know, what are the odds um, of uh, a child who is born to a family uh, whose income is uh, approximately in the 25th uh, percentile of the income distribution, roughly $30,000. What are the odds of their income being higher, as an adult, being higher than, than what their parents' uh, incomes were? And here you can see that there's uh, potential diverging uh, destinies between the more rural areas uh, in the southeast of the United States, as well as some of our Native American uh, reservations out west. Uh, compared to the rural communities in the uh, plains, the Great Plains and the, in the upper Midwest, where, where there does seem to be uh, different opportunities uh, uh, depending on where you're from. And, and this has led uh, to some concern about, and I'll wrap up with this last, about this uh, link between um, inequality and uh, upward mobility, and that uh, what this figure is showing is that um, uh, places with lower inequality, which is measured on the horizontal axis, uh, so as your uh, uh, point 0.3 is less inequality than point 0.5, for example, those places with lower inequality have higher upward mobility. And so this is suggesting that, you know, economically, and this is some of the economic background that fed into the volume, that, that uh, uh, there are pockets, uh, rural America is not uh, a singular place that there are some parts of uh, rural places uh, where economic mobility from one generation to the next is very, very strong. Uh, but then there are other uh, parts of uh, uh, rural America where economic mobility is, is quite low and, and, and is more in common with uh, our large urban areas. So again, some of these uh, this uh, boundary crossing and shared destinies. And with that, I will turn it over to Mark to talk about uh, his research that was part of the, uh, the volume. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Jim. Uh, this is Mark Partridge uh, from Ohio State University. And I'm going to discuss uh, uh, the rural-urban continuum. And uh, uh, Basically, I'll start with what, uh, just to follow up, try to complement what Dan was talking about, is that uh, one of the things that, that's been happening in rural areas is that it really depends on how you define rural, how badly or how well it's doing. So if you actually go back to 1950, if you go back to 1950, uh, uh, you, if you go back to 1950, you look at what was metropolitan America back then in 1950, and you look at it, what, 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 uh, what happened, actually it was the non-metropolitan, the rural areas that actually grew faster from 1950 on. What's happened, as Jim was noting, uh, and Daniel was noting, is, is that you get this reclassification that, that uh, successful rural areas become urban, 
Uh, likewise, uh, nearby rural areas that were near urban areas now become uh, urban. And so basically it's, it's like a sports league where you take the best team out every year and pretty soon you're left with a pretty slow growing group of counties and places that, are, that represent rural America. So a lot of this, what's happened in rural America is actually a success story. I guess the challenge is, is what's left is more remote areas that face more economic challenges. So as, uh, as uh, uh, Jim was talking about, one of the things that I want to discuss is small and medium city growth versus large city growth in, in the sense that I want to give a feeling for this, this more of an urban-centric process where rural areas feel like they're left behind. Then I'm going to talk about uh, how the economy changes along the rural-urban divide, or I should also say the continuum. Uh, as Dan noted, it's, uh, you know, you go from Manhattan, it's, that's the most urban you could get to, say, near where I grew up uh, in southeastern Montana, which is about the most remote areas. Uh, and then I'm going to describe, you know, some, some economic strategies that rural areas can use. And one of the things that I'll stress is that I, I, don't, I think the picture for rural America is uh, maybe a little bit too dire right now in the sense that I think, uh, you know, in, in terms of the election, there was somewhat of a perfect storm that rural America was particularly hard hit. Uh, commodity prices had come off this really big high in 2014, you know, whether it's oil or, or agriculture and so on. And so right, you know, they both were hitting at 2016 and it really, you know, added an extra, you know, this more of this anxiety that drove rural America uh, to vote the way it did. Uh, so in terms of cities, Daniel noted this uh, this bias towards large cities, and in, in that you know only economic growth can come in large cities, and so all sorts of uh, NGOs such as the World Bank uh, uh, they came out with a very influential report that's you know influenced uh, economic development around the world the way some people have thought about it. And what they argued is is that growth you should support the largest cities, put your resources in the largest cities. They're the most productive. They have all the advantages. And if you support lagging rural areas, you're shifting resources from places that are growing really fast to places that are really, you know, that are going to go slower, and you're going to actually lower growth rates. And this, you know, though not to the extreme, you have uh, followers like the Brookings Institute's uh, urban uh, program and so on that, you know, really promotes that, and it gets into the buzz that you, in the major newspapers that uh, large cities is really where it's at. And but, however, you know, there's been a lot of pushback in the academic community and and elsewhere in the NGOs, like o the OECD, the uh, European Community, uh, and others, and including myself, have pushed back that really have noted that if you look at developed countries, including the United States, it's actually the small cities and medium cities that are growing faster. So in the, in the sense, there's an over, we, you know, we're arguing there's actually an over-focus on the largest cities. And uh, uh, the other feature is, is that when you talk about what, you know, wh where you should be putting your resources, uh, one of the things is that should be considered is that the, the city might be growing faster. However, if it's sucking the life out of the nearby rural areas, you know, on balance, that might not be so good. And so there's these offsetting effects that urban areas help economic growth because uh, the growth spreads out and creates commuting opportunities and markets. However, urban growth could create backwash in rural areas by sucking up all the resources, uh, brain drain, uh, financial capital moves from rural to urban, and so uh, there's, there's these two competing factors, you know, which one dominates. And then finally, uh, you know, coming back to the largest cities that really promote rural growth in a lot of areas, it's, it's through urban commuting, and one of the problems that the biggest cities have in terms of promoting that is, that, is the congestion's larger, and giving another advantage for small and medium cities in terms of promoting not only do they grow faster themselves, but they have more beneficial effects on uh, nearby uh, rural areas. Uh, in terms of now switching you know, that broad picture, now taking a look along the rural-urban continuum, you know, that it's you know, this continuum, it's, I think it's really important to recognize that rural America is not necessarily the stereotype that you might read in the New York Times, where uh, it's a dying uh, agricultural-based community in, in in the, you know, that, that's quite remote and, and it, it has no hope. Uh, and and that's, that's really simplistic. Uh, it, uh, there's really three different types of rural America. One is the high amenity areas, which uh, outside of a period around the Great Recession, a little bit after, uh, outside of that period, they've been doing relatively well. 
Then there's urban adjacent areas that are near urban areas that have all the commuting opportunities. Uh, that's kind of, as Dan, Dan was pointing out earlier, you know, how you define urban versus rural matters. Are they, are they rural? Are they, are they urban? But these, these low density areas near urban areas have actually done relatively well. What, what is the rural that is struggling is more remote areas. It's, uh, it, these are areas that are dependent on commodity production, whether it's forestry, mining, uh, agriculture, and the problem with a, if that's what you rely on is that those sectors have been experiencing for a century rapid productivity growth. That means they're employing fewer and fewer and fewer people, and thus you have this extra labor supplier, a redundant labor force that, you know, they, they don't have jobs and they have to they often move to urban areas. And so it's mainly the third one that if you want to come back and say, well, what are areas that are struggling? It's going to be mainly in three. Uh, so uh, one of the things that, you know, in terms of supporting this growth, is, as I was acknowledging earlier, was that uh, growth from urban areas, if you actually look at the empirical evidence, tends to spread out a long ways. Uh, uh, maybe up to uh, 125 miles, a two-hour commute. Uh, I'm not necessarily saying people are actually driving that, but just the connection to the urban area is, is beneficial. But those gains uh, for rural areas tend to end at about five, you know, 500,000, a million people in the urban area. In other words, it starts getting too congested for commuting and other, other things. So in, in terms of my research, look at well, what would be the perfect city to support, support itself, but also support broader rural areas, it'd be a place like Omaha. <laughs> and so in that sense, I guess one message is we need more Omahas for rural America. Uh, turning to, you know, what, what are some of the economic development hopes in rural areas? And, you know, it's, a, it's the real feature that rural communities lack is what economists call agglomeration economies, that cities have advantages that make them more productive. They have better, you know, more, more larger, more flexible labor market. They have more, more people that have higher education. You get knowledge spillovers. You get, uh, you get uh, a greater variety of inputs for, that businesses can purchase. Uh, so cities have these big advantages that rural areas lack. And so you know, despite that, I think one of the problems that rural areas have had, and, and there was some success at this, say, back in the 1970s, but it's, it's probably gone on way too long after that, is trying to attract big manufacturers, you know, which at that time made sense because rural areas have you know, low wages, low land costs. You know, the problem today is, is Vietnam has even lower uh, labor and land costs. But still, rural towns are, are too, uh, generally too focused on bringing in these large firms that are going to save the town. And the problem with that is, is that they often overbid. They give them too much. Or the firm, you know, once once their subsidies run out, they just move on to greener pastures, you know, or or maybe even outsource the job. So what we have argued in terms of our research, what makes much better sense for rural areas is that is is trying to enhance small de business development and entrepreneurship locally, uh, uh, which I'll talk about here in a minute. Other things that rural areas have is is that demographers point out that out migration from rural areas is especially high when you're young adults. This, the bright lights of the city and job opportunities attract uh, rural Americans. But as you get back into your 30s, though not to the extent of the out-migration, there is in-migration back into rural areas, typically of people in their 30s who, or 40s who now have families and they miss the rural uh, lifestyle or they want to experience the rural lifestyle for their children. And so it, a reasonable economic development strategy is thinking, well, how can I attract that kind of person and it's things like good public schools locally and, and other quality of life attributes that, so that those people will pick your community. And then coming back to small business development, uh, generally it has a much bigger multiplier. Uh, we found up to five. In other words, you create one small business job, you create in total five other jobs, which is really high. That's a, typically the number's around 1.5 for multipliers. In other words, you create one job, you create another half a job somewhere else. And so this is despite the fact that people criticize small business development because small businesses pay lower wages. Uh, however, they buy, the, they buy their inputs locally, their profits stay local, so there's reasons why there's a bigger bang per buck. And, and likewise, they, they create this entrepreneurial culture with, uh, with spillovers. Uh, so in terms of the continuum, 
what we found is that uh, uh, in terms of what I just described is small business development, one, one is just coming back to these city sizes. Small cities tend to promote rural business development out, say, you know, 60, 70 miles in the sense that they create commuting opportunities. But by the time you get to the large cities, they tend to crowd out uh, small businesses. It's going to be very hard to create uh, small business development near large cities because the people will say, uh, I have better, I have better, there, there's just better services in the large city. Why would I ever want to go to a small business in a rural area? So again, coming back to the small and medium-sized cities tend to you know, have better effects in terms of growth in rural areas. Uh, so, uh, and, and then finally, uh, what we find is, is that if you took, if you take a look saying, okay, well, you know, what, what kind of city rural structure that would be most efficient? Well, it, it does describe that small cities tend to have advantages in terms of promoting rural growth. Uh, medium cities don't have as big advantages as promoting rural growth. However, growth within small cities is a little bit, I mean, I'm sorry, medium cities is a little bit easier to achieve than in small cities. And then finally, large cities tend to be growing less than the medium-sized cities, and they create these negative spillovers in the rural areas in terms of you know, the crowd-out business development and, and, and so forth. So the overall picture is, the takeaway is that um, uh, I, rural areas are not all dying by any means. There's certainly a lot of them that are doing poorly, I, as I said, I think a lot of this is at a cyclical low that we're really catching it at a downward part. However, uh, rural areas need to be smarter in terms of how they do economic development uh, and thinking about more within their community than trying to hope somebody will come in and save their community. So I'll turn it over to Shannon now. Thanks, Mark. Uh, so my job is to summarize the volume and kind of bring in some of the topics that haven't really been addressed by the other uh, presenters. Um, so for me, this annals volume really represents themes of diversity and disparity and interdependence between rural and urban areas, and you've heard some about that already. You know, in terms of diversity, we've, we've kind of always understood that urban areas are diverse, and the media and politicians and academics, we talk about them that way, but we're sort of less aware of rural diversity, uh, certainly racial ethnic diversity, but also economic diversity, as Mark just noted. Um, rural areas range from being in dire straits to actually doing quite well, uh, and rural labor markets vary quite a lot. Um, it's interesting, I pulled my undergrad students here at Syracuse uh, a couple of weeks ago about what they thought was the primary employment industry in rural areas, um, and despite the fact that farming contributes less than 10% of employment in the U.S., my students overwhelmingly selected farming as the largest rural employer. Um, also, political diversity. Um, it might surprise some of us to know that not all rural places are filled with Republican voters. Uh, as Scala and Johnson point out in their article in this volume, there are actually some pretty progressive liberal areas, including uh, natural amenity and recreation communities. So what I want to do is illustrate some of these takeaways using uh, some of the different measures of well-being and, and politics that were addressed in the annals volume and, and then compare the findings in this volume to how the media have been portraying rural areas recently and, and this so-called rural-urban divide. Um, there are a lot of long-term implications to what's happening in rural areas uh, and along the rural-urban interface, things like growing income inequality, certainly, and the political divergence, uh, but also the opioid epidemic and, and declines in life expectancy and natural population decline. Um, it's really interesting to me that the way that we talk and write and think about rural America now is a lot like how we were talking and writing about inner cities uh, in the 1980s. And rather than diverging, there's actually been a lot of convergence um, in terms of the economic and, and demographic conditions. And a lot of this has been due to major structural changes, uh, economic changes, government disinvestments, and the outmigration of, of the best and brightest, so that the plight that inner cities were experiencing in the 80s has now become the plight of exurbs and, and rural areas, things like drug abuse and family breakdown and crime. Um, and what's happened as a result is it's led to a nearly monolithic portrait of the way that rural is presented in the media as the geography in dire straits. 
But as you just heard Mark suggest, and as other authors in this volume show, it's not an entirely accurate representation. So I'm going to use the research from the Annals volume uh, on things like mobility and education and crime and, and health and politics to try to illustrate that rural isn't always in dire straits. So what this shows is a population loss and, and population growth in non-metro counties. Um, and the peach are lost counties and the red are growth counties. And what you can see is that certainly there's been population loss in a lot of rural areas, but there's also been a quite significant growth in some places, especially in natural amenity and retirement areas. Weber and his colleagues show that intergenerational mobility uh, among low-income youth, which is uh, achieving better STS than your parents, is actually higher in, in rural counties. And their research on math and reading test scores, Burdick, Will, and Logan show that uh, both the most urban and most rural schools performed the worst, while the suburban schools, those that are actually at the interface of rural and urban areas, do the best. And in that way, suburbs may represent sort of these geographies of opportunity that, that bridge rural and urban areas. So what those patterns illustrate is that there are definitely geographic disparities in well-being and opportunity, but they don't always follow a clear rural-urban gradient. On other indicators, rural and urban areas have, all, have actually converged and not always in good ways. So for example, um, Cornwall and Hall show that perceptions of neighborhood crime have increased in suburbs and exurbs and rural areas so that the rural urban gap in perceptions of, of crime has actually declined. Again, making rural and urban more similar than different and illustrating this theme of boundary crossing that we keep hearing about. Likewise, research from this volume uh, shows that health disparities don't always follow a clear urban-rural gradient. So for example, young adult cardiovascular health is best in the most urban areas, but not that far behind in the most rural areas. And it's actually uh, worse off right in the middle of the rural-urban continuum. Likewise, food insecurity rates are lowest in the most urban and most rural counties. And it's counties along the middle of the continuum that have higher food insecurity rates. In my own research, I examine uh, geographic differences in drug, alcohol, and suicide mortality rates. So this map shows um, high rates of drug overdose mortality in many rural parts of the country, to be sure, certainly Appalachia, Oklahoma, um, parts of the West. But it also shows a lot of rural areas have among the lowest drug mortality rates in this country, and in many ways um, mirrors the map of intergenerational mobility, with the exception of the South um, that Mark showed earlier. So despite the, the current media emphasis on the rural opioid epidemic, drug overdose rates are actually lowest in rural areas overall, uh, but things like suicide rates are the highest in rural areas. So if we think about that, it could be that despair just manifests itself differently in different types of counties. And when we don't understand these problems, what could happen is that much needed resources to combat them are not distributed to the places that really need them the most. I think that um, the distribution of heroin in the U.S. is a really good example of this overlap and boundary blurring between rural and urban that the volume is emphasizing. Uh, we have to understand that drug distribution doesn't just stop at a county border. Uh, heroin was once a largely urban problem, but it's now routinely sold in many parts of rural America where it used to be absent, uh, powered by these networks that can essentially deliver drugs like pizza, as Sam Quinones points out in his really good book, Dreamland. Um, he talks about how dealers drove into rural states where disability payments and pain prescriptions had massively spiked. And this was happening just as these places were starting to clamp down on pill mill pharmacies. Um, and these dealers avoided cities. They avoided the largest urban areas because they wanted to av avoid the black drug gangs. So they stuck to the suburbs and the rural outskirts and they really uh, thrived in these areas. And then, of course, we have politics. So the role of the rural vote was this really provocative storyline in the aftermath of the recent presidential election. And in a bunch of articles that came out after the election, journalists argued that Trump was victorious due to uh, this rural American frustration with political insiders, years of neglect, uh, lots of social problems. Uh, and to be sure, Donald Trump received a much larger share of the rural vote than Hillary Clinton. And her vote share declined with increasing levels of virality. 
Um, but the, Clinton's rural disadvantage in the election didn't necessarily signal a new trend, perhaps a more dramatic trend than what we've seen in previous elections. But as Scala and, and Ken Johnson show in this volume, Republicans have long won larger rural vote shares, especially in like Appalachia and the Great Plains and parts of the South. Um, it's also important to point out that rural voters really account for only about 15% of the total U.S. population and a similar share of votes cast in 2016. So even though Clinton had a, a big disadvantage in rural areas and that disadvantage uh, was really pronounced in the most rural areas, it wasn't sufficient to swing the election or to support uh, the media rhetoric of like this new rural revolt. Uh, again, Scala and Johnson point out that not all rural places are filled with Republican voters. Um, it's true that many are and that gerrymandering has given them even more political power, but there are also these progressive liberal areas, including natural amenity recreation communities, where a lot of urban residents move uh, when they reach retirement age. So instead of a rural revolt, uh, Trump's combined rural and small city overperformance and, and Clinton's underperformance in those places, especially the industrial Midwest, was kind of the key to his victory. Um, and so what you see from this map is this significant spatial dependence and overlap in this clustering of voting behavior, including overlap across rural and urban boundaries. And so even though rural and urban places uh, have wide divergent voting patterns, it's important to point out that they share the destiny of politics. They share the president, whether or not um, they all voted for him or not. It's also important to point out that increases in economic distress have been spatially clustered. Uh, and again, these, these increases in economic distress, uh, which have been building over time, but which were exacerbated by the Great Recession, they haven't been confined to rural areas. Um, some rural areas have actually done pretty well, and small and medium-sized cities have been hurt just as much, if not more, by industrial and economic changes. So to wrap up, um, the articles in this volume really highlight the tremendous interdependence and similarities across and between rural and urban spaces and the way that media and think tanks often talk about differences between rural and urban uh, is in terms of their contribution to, to GDP. But our emphasis on GDP overvalues the financial sector, which of course is housed in the largest cities. Uh, and who, if we remember, were responsible for major economic losses over the past decade. And the attention to GDP conversely undervalues the important contributions that rural areas make to the economy. These are contributions on which urban residents rely. So, for instance, rural people in places supply disproportionate shares of the country's food, energy, military personnel, natural amenity recreation, retirement destinations. They also house disproportionate shares of our prisoners and our garbage. Uh, and these are all things that high output urban America really depend on. I mean, can you imagine trash piling up on a big mountain in the middle of, of Times Square in New York City? No, so you can see that uh, New York sends their garbage to rural states, uh, including upstate New York. Um, and, you know, these are places that, that house prisoners as well. And so, again, a tremendous amount of interdependence. So I think now uh, I'll wrap up and maybe it's time for questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all for um, uh, dynamiting all my cherished um, conventional wisdom that I hold. I'm, I'm, I'm devastated to find out how much, how different things are from the way that I, I had assumed. And I, I think as the headline showed, as a lot of people did, we have a, a, a handful of questions that have already come in, and I'm going to ask that we probably not get too many more because I don't know that we're going to get we're going to have time for them. One of the the first ones that I wanted to talk about just quickly, and I'm not quite sure who to address this to, is we haven't talked at all about the, how broadband infrastructure has has affected the rural urban divide, and I'm wondering, or the lack of rural urban divide, as, as we have seen, and I'm wondering if anybody would like to take that one. I can take that one. Uh, it's Mark Partridge. Uh, it, it, uh, it, and one thing I'll just note that, that in rural areas in particular, there was a lot of hope. Uh, there's been a lot of hope that now with, broad, with broadband, if we could just get more broadband, then we'll have uh, more people can buy from us and, and, and so forth. And actually, uh, up to now in terms of this uh, 
information revolution that began in the 1990s up to now, that's actually been more supportive of urban growth in that, yes, you can buy more from rural areas, but now you can buy even cheaper area, cheaper things from urban areas, like as Daniel noted, Amazon. So in that sense, uh, broadband is not necessarily a savior for rural areas. However, it is lacking. It is definitely, uh, there's slower speeds in rural areas. There's typically less access. And where it really would play a role is in things like education, where you know educational curriculums are now based on having access to the internet for homework and so forth. And so this could really put certain children at a disadvantage that they don't have access to broadband. So I, I look at it less on the business side where you know it helps businesses in rural areas, but there's a, even a larger importance of it, say, for households. That, you know, their quality of life is really rests on access to broadband. Thank you. Um, and we had a suite of questions that came in that, that talked about the demographic differences among youth in the urban and rural areas. And I'm, I'm wondering if, um, and there's different aspects of this, uh, their, their political uh, affiliation, their, their role in governance, and, uh, and perhaps even their, their health, health differences. And I'm wondering if someone would uh, just touch on, on youth. Uh, I can do that. This is Dan, Dan Lichter. Um, you know, that's been a chronic problem in rural areas that they've lost young people. Uh, the rural areas have uh, lost, uh, lost, uh, lost uh, young people, especially those who go on to college or go on to find uh, jobs, the most skilled and so on in bigger cities. So this has been a, cro a chronic problem. And the issue is always how do we keep these uh, kids in the local community. And then I think we we start getting back to some of Mark's uh, suggestions about the need to to focus on the development of places sort of I uh, internally. Um, the other the other part of this, I think, uh, has to do with how we educate our kids in schools. I think there's a, a book by uh, Maria Cafellis and, and uh, uh, a car that talks about the hollowing out of rural America. What they're really talking about is that local communities, the professional class, the local business elites and so on invest heavily in schools that benefit their kids. And those are the kids that actually leave the communities. And in the meantime, they tend not to invest in kids who are likely to be around. And so the kids that stay there are the kids that are least equipped to be successful or entrepreneurial in their own community. So I think this is a chronic problem. It's very difficult to to figure out how to how to change that over time, Shannon, you may have some some ideas about this too, since you're now in upstate New York, which has been a chronic problem in many rural schools. How do you keep your young people? Yeah, I think uh, there's been this consistent devaluing of not going to college and uh, devaluing of the types of trade jobs that can actually provide really livable uh, wages to some kids who remain in rural areas. Um, in upstate New York, I think about the BOCES program um, and the ability of that program to give great skills to kids who may not be interested or just may not be college material. Uh, and so, I, you know, I think schools make a mistake by channeling and filtering, you know, the working class kids into uh, BOCES and the upper class kids into college track courses and valuing one more than the other. Is, is there any trend that's occurring in rural areas that you think is, are, is really going to exacerbate the, the rural economic challenges? Is there, is there one thing that we should be keeping an eye out for? In particular, is there some, one thing that we should be keeping an eye out for that hasn't been talked about before? Can I just say really quickly, one thing I think we haven't talked very much about here is just the role that immigration has played for many small rural communities. The, the communities that are growing in rural areas, in addition to the high amenity areas, are some of the areas that have uh, that are associated with agriculture, meatpacking plants, uh, other big agricultural pursuits. And in many ways, immigrants are a demographic lifeline for dying small towns. And it was the case not too long ago where Iowa actually had an extensive advertising com uh, campaign to bring in uh, new immigrants into the to these rural communities because they saw them as a as a source of economic vi vi vitality and, uh, and, and population growth. So, you know, that's one thing I think that we need to think a little bit more about. I mentioned that 60% of the growth in rural areas over the first 10 years of the, of the 2000s was 
Hispanic population growth moving from the from the southwest primarily into many parts of the American heartland, the southeast and the like. Uh, so I think that's one area. I'll just follow up uh, one real quick point about uh, economic development and where where the conditions is, is a sign that something is wrong. Is, is, is Shannon referred to this kind of this backward view of the economy that what you were 50 years ago is what people still think you are. And in that sense, if you are agriculture, you think you're agriculture. And the weakness is, is instead of focusing on industries that could also come in, there's an overemphasis on what you did 50 years ago. And, and that, that you'll see that in manufacturing areas, that they'll just only focus on that. So I, 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 this backward-looking view is one of the challenges that rural areas and, and all areas need to avoid. Yeah, I'd like to explore that. That's, you know, this is a, um, our political leaders, unfortunately, uh, kind of feed into that too often. And uh, uh, rather than being more forward and dynamic thinking, they, they do tend to, to hone in on, on the past and, and use it to their political advantage. But ultimately, that, that uh, I think, leads to, to harm in those local communities rather than being forward looking. Uh, Michael, I'd like to underscore one, one issue where I believe we're uh, kind of the, the, the challenge between rural and our larger urban areas, and that's, and that's to emphasize the point that Mark made, which is where the digital divide, the broadband, is going to have its potential greatest effects is amongst the, the youth of today. And, uh, and that's where I think we're going to see play out the, the potential divide between uh, our more urban areas versus our more remote areas is that for individuals, children with lack of access to that uh, broadband are, are not going to uh, have the same access to education opportunities um, that, that the urban areas will have. I'm afraid we're, we've run out of time. Um, I, I want to tell those that have sent in questions, and there's some excellent questions that we haven't had a chance to to address that we will be uh, we'll be asking our panelists to answer some of these in writing after the fact and that we'll put it uh, when we post the link to the archived webinar also if you wanted to send a question in quickly even after the webinar use the uh, hashtag sage talks um, for, uh, to tweet and we will see that but I want to thank you for joining us and I want to give a, a special thanks clearly to Dan James Shannon and Mark and we will send an email that will include a link to that uh, archive webinar and slides and again those additional uh, answers to the questions and it will all be hosted on socialsciencebase.com and please stay connected to us uh, at Social Science Base and please make sure that the annals of the American Academy of Political and Social Science is on your reading list because they'll have an additional a this special issue from July and then also upcoming special issues so please again thank you very much and goodbye.